Thanks again, Alexi. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, as Alexi said, my name is Chris Fish. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks. Um, and before that, I was a data engineer working primarily with Spark. I've been working with Spark for about five and a half years um, since version 0 0.8. Um, as most of you know, Delta and Delta in particular is what we're going to talk about today. Um, Spark as well, right, is a, a scalability project implemented in Scala, um, and then a lot of people also use it in their AI projects for big data, distributed computation, things like hyperparameter tuning, that kind of stuff. So we're going to focus primarily on Delta Lake today. Um, Delta Lake, uh, uh, the other person's name here, Michael Armbrust, you may recognize. He's one of the core uh, Spark committers, and he's the creator of Spark SQL as well. So he's got a, a PhD in database systems, and then he implemented Spark SQL uh, for Spark. Um, so he's the author of data frames, data sets, uh, big on streaming as well. And then Delta Lake arose out of not just the challenges he experienced managing his own pipelines, but what we saw at all of our customers as well. So uh, we like to start off by sort of telling the story that motivated Delta in the first place. Uh, it really starts with the promise of a data lake, right? So businesses have data being produced by things, right? And in today's world, we have data being produced by a lot of things. You may have customer data coming from your iPhone devices. You may have data coming from sensors that you've placed somewhere. Um, you might own a website that's producing a lot of data. And we've realized over time that data is actually very valuable and storage has become very cheap, right? So we want to capture all of it and we want to put it somewhere that then we can query. But we don't want to store it directly in a database because that will become expensive um, and our Oracle bills will go through the roof. So instead, we're going to store it in a more unstructured way in a data lake, and that's what most people do, right? And then, OK, great. So the business says, why are you doing this? Well, we're going to be able to do all of this great data science and machine learning with our data. We're going to build recommendation engines. We're going to build predictive engines. We're going to evaluate our risk better. We're going to have greater insights. Or maybe we'll do things that have never been done before, like we'll be able to sequence full human genomes and do analysis on that, right? So the promise of data is great. But what really happens in reality is your systems are maybe producing terrible data. Um, they're producing inaccurate data. They're producing wrong data. They're structuring it improperly. And then now you've stored all of that, but it was garbage in the first place, and now you've just stored your garbage in a garbage collector. And then your predictive systems are also terrible because the data quality going in wasn't good in the first place. And especially you know, as you get more and more into data science or machine learning, you learn that it really is about the quality of the training data and not just the quantity at all. Um, and so this is actually a huge problem because you can't derive value out of something that you can't have certainty about. So how does a typical data lake project actually evolve? A lot of people will start by collecting events, right? And usually you'll collect them into some sort of system like Kafka and eventually start to retrieve them, right? So I have data flowing into my append-only event log. And let's say, OK, the CEO says, I want to know real time how many people are using the app. OK, so you say, all right, I need to build streaming analytics. So I need to build a stream, I need to write my code, I need to point it directly at Kafka and pull the data right away. And so now I have a streaming report going on, but how can I do historical queries on this data as well? Right? I can't do historical queries in my stream. My stream is focused on the real-time live data. Instead, I need to possibly do something like a Lambda architecture. So maybe if I want to do historical queries, I'm going to have two, way, two things pulling from Kafka. One is creating a real-time report, but the other is just syncing my data into a data lake where I can go back and look at it offline. And so, OK, this is working pretty fine. You know, maybe I had to uh, configure my Kafka topics a little bit differently, load balance a little bit, but for the most part, things are fine. I have two streams pointing at them. One's going to a real-time report. The other is going to my data lake. But this was a little bit of implementation overhead. I had to tune some things. I had to go in. I had to implement the code. 
OK, now, so now I can query my data lake. I can go in and I can start building out, you know, a data scientist says, oh, I actually want the data a aggregated in this particular way because that's the feature that has the most predictive usefulness for the model I'm trying to build. So you go in and you build some nice pipeline and you pull in the business data they want and you start building those things. But then the data scientist says, hey, uh, the data you've put here in the data lake does not match up with the report you've been showing the CEO. And it turns out I'm saying something different to the CEO and he's been telling the board these other numbers, uh, which ones are actually accurate here. So you say, okay, well, I am not, these are two separate processes, so I need to do some kind of validation between them. I need to look at both stream and offline reporting. I need to check, do these numbers actually match up? Okay, so that's not you know, crazy difficult to do. I can do that, right? I can, I can take wherever I'm putting the streaming report to, potentially you know, some database, I can pull those numbers, and then offline I can run a job and compare them to the data lake. And say, so, okay, okay, so I can validate these numbers, definitely. I can compare, I can make sure that they're all accurate. But again, I did have to do some implementation, right? I had to start pulling this data, maybe duplicate some data again, and I had to set up another job um, in order to validate that these were actually accurate. But let's say my validation job actually does find an error. It finds a discrepancy, and it says, oh, you know, like over here in the data lake, we actually messed up last month's data, and we want to rebuild those metrics. So how am I gonna do that, right? Spark's native data sources don't provide me a way to go back and transactionally update data in the past, right? So what a lot of people do, and what I have done in the past, and probably a lot of us here, is you partition your data lake by date. And then you can go in and you can simply delete the old data and put the updated data in the same place with the date. And so this lets me do updates. Like, I'm having to delete and rewrite a lot of data in just in order to do updates, but I am able to do some kind of updates if there's a problem. But again, now the complexity of my project has grown, grown quite a bit. But let's say I want to go in and do just a fine-grained update. Like, for instance, I got a GDPR request to delete someone's data or the newly released CCPA, which I'm sure caused a lot of roadmaps to get messed up. Um, well, that's really hard to do, actually, because I can only overwrite at the partition level with Parquet or RC. And so even if I just want to delete a single row in my data lake, I actually need to delete a whole folder and rewrite everything. And so, okay, I can do this, yes, but this is now starting to add a lot of operational complexity overall. Right? And especially if something breaks in the middle, if my write job fails in the middle, maybe I'll lose that data forever, hopefully not. Uh, but even if I haven't, I may have left partially written or corrupt data there, in which case I'll have to go in and clean that up manually and then reschedule all of my downstream jobs and play the scheduling game to make sure things are running in the correct order and the data is being picked up by the downstream jobs. That was the next slide. So, okay, but I did all of this. I, like, I implemented all of it. <clears throat> it works. It does the correct things. I'm confident in my metrics. I'm confident in the numbers. But what have I spent? Uh, what costs have I incurred in doing all of this? I've wasted, not wasted, but I've spent a lot of my employer's time and money doing this. I've spent a lot of my time doing this. I've also caused a lot of headaches for myself. I've had to learn a lot of things. I've had to debug a lot of problems. And the main thing is that I'm not focused on the data, right? I haven't really spent a lot of time learning about my actual data. Instead, I've spent all this time learning about the storage systems, about the query execution engine, about bugs that could exist in there, but I'm not learning deeper insights about my actual data, which I actually am trying to derive business value out of. And that's what you really started this project for, right, was to try and derive business value out of your data, try and accomplish something with it. And instead, you ended up doing all these other things, which are fun and interesting, but not the original purpose of my project. So these are sort of the, the main distractions that are causing these problems, right? Uh, atomicity, right? 
for the A and ACID transactions means that when my upstream job fails, it leaves behind partial data or corrupt data, and it breaks downstream readers. My quality enforcement, right? In a normal database, we can set strict schema enforcement rules. We can say this column is always an integer. This column is always a, a website. This column is always an email address. I can't do that in my data lake. Instead, I need to write my own code to do that and implement it in, in a pretty heavy way. I need to go in and make sure every job is enforcing the quality of it itself. And then there's no consistency or isolation between reads and writes. And so this makes it really, really difficult to mix streaming and batch workloads here. So it's very hard to stream and batch write into a single data source. It's also very hard to be streaming and batch reading off of that data source at the same time. And really, a lot of the scheduling game is just making sure a certain table is actually available to be read at the time I go to read it. So how does Delta Lake actually improve upon this? What features does it offer? Um, and a recent announcement for Delta Lake as well is that it was donated to the Linux Foundation in November. Um, so this is sort of like moving it out of Databricks, you know, corporate ownership and putting it in a place where it can actually become a full-fledged open source project. And one of the main things here that I do want to try to get from people is um, the project itself has a lot of room to implement a lot of things. Um, a lot of like traditional database techniques over the next few years will be built in it. So if you're an enterprising young software engineer or a really experienced software engineer as well and can actually add a lot of knowledge to the project, it's a really great time to get involved in Delta Lake. So instead of this mess um, of having to schedule things and repartition and do validation and updates and merges are difficult, Instead, we want to think more just about how the data is flowing end to end, right? We have on the right-hand side, we have what we want to do with our data. We want to get real-time analytics. We want to do artificial intelligence. We want to build models, build feature engines. We want to do reporting. We want these things to be accurate, and we want them to be running all the time. We want up-to-date data. Now on the left hand side, we have our raw data sources, our Kafka, Kinesis, um, Event Hub in Azure, um, or text-based sources as well. And all we want is to set up the flow. Um, we want to focus on our business logic and not focus on systems problems and have everything just naturally flow through. So Delta provides full ACID transaction compliance. What this means is that any writer that's writing to the table either succeeds or fails and never leaves the table in a corrupt state. So any writer will never affect a downstream reader because of snapshot isolation. So when a reader goes to read the table, it'll read actually a specific version of that table. And so an upstream writer that modifies it won't actually affect these downstream jobs. On the flip side, on the upstream side, you can be streaming into a table, and at the same time, you can batch write to it on the, sort of on the back end. So let's say you want to like, fix last month's data, but you have live data streaming in. You can do that, because, again, because of snapshot isolation. So just like a database, you get these ACID transaction guarantees now. <clears throat> and again, one of the main reasons we decided to donate it um, as an open source project is because storing data is a big decision, right? Data itself is hard to move around. If I have 10 petabytes of data, I'm not likely to want to store it in some system that, isn't, that I have no insight into, right? And I don't want to be locked into that system either. So I'm gonna, if I'm going to choose to put that much data into a particular storage system, I want to be able to understand how that storage actually works. And then most people in today's tech world have standardized on using Apache Spark for ETL, for doing most of the data writing. Um, and then in some cases, you know, other engines like Flink as well. So Delta's designed first and foremost for writing to by Spark with both the streaming and batch uh, uh, use cases in mind. And so this lets you convert your existing jobs with minimal modifications. It's literally just a new data source for Spark. Instead of doing format parquet, you're doing format delta. 
And we'll see an example of how the actual syntax works later on. And then under the hood, um, we'll get into this later, but under the hood, Delta is actually storing the data as Parquet and then doing the metadata management for you. So and the, the architecture pattern that ends up arising as a result of this is that we see people dumping very raw data into a bronze level staging table. So your Kafka has a retention period you know, of, of a day or a few days, so you need to get that data out of Kafka. Um, same with Kinesis, and you want to put it into cheap object storage. So you immediately sync all of that raw data into a Delta Lake, but you do very minimal processing here. So you, we have some customers who will leave the data as uh, binary data, as byte arrays, or other customers who will do minimal JSON parsing and then put the data into a bronze table. Then you have these mid-level mid tables where you maybe you've started to do some small aggregations or you start to pull in business logic. Are you doing customer lookups or, or other things like that? And then this data is you know, maybe consumable by some of the you know, higher level people, who data scientists who want to go further than just the highest level aggregates. And then on the far end, you have your business reporting level aggregates that you might point something like Tableau at or some other reporting feature. You might show this to your executives. And then the bronze here is still on fire because that data is hot. This is where your live, real-time data is going to be coming in. And you're not going to be altering it very much, right? So this data is not that valuable yet. But then the silver data is very valuable already because you started to implement some of your actual business logic. You started to pull in extra information. And this is where you're going to go if you find issues with your top level aggregates, right? You're going to go to the underlying data set and say, OK, like, is there a problem with the lookups? Am I exploding the data somewhere? Am I double counting something somewhere? And then you can also point other groups to this. Like data scientists will oftentimes prefer the silver tables over the gold tables. And then over in the gold tables, really the highest level data that you can expose to your analysts, large groups of people who expect numbers to be set in stone and expect them to be accurate. Um, and in particular, we just released um, a native Hive reader for Delta. And then currently you can query Delta tables from Presto, but they don't always get the latest snapshot of the table. So we're working with um, Starburst at the moment to build out the Presto connector as well. And then the other thing is that because it's inherently designed as a streaming data source, you can actually start moving a lot of workloads over to a streaming um, abstraction. And this is really powerful for a bunch of reasons. A lot of people think that streaming means like I'm doing something real time. I'm doing a real time use case and I need, you know, sub second, super fast processing. In reality, streaming has the same API for data frames as um, batch workloads in Spark, right? So your code is easily swappable between the two. And then streaming adds a bunch of stability improvements to your batch workloads. So streams process the data incrementally. So over time, as you add new data, you don't have to reprocess the entire batch every time. Instead, you can just update with the latest data. And this can minimize uh, your compute costs as well as minimize sort of the actual access costs that S3 or blob storage will charge you, right? And then <clears throat> if you need to, you can have low latency jobs. You can move over between, swap between like a, a time-based trigger or a manual trigger. And then also this sort of eliminates having to schedule batch jobs as well. You can leave these streams always running and expect that the data will end up where you want it to without having to consciously think about scheduling these things. And especially, um, you know, like you can automatically retry. So even if these streaming jobs do break, you can easily restart them without having to do manual intervention. And then because the creator of Delta is the Spark SQL person, uh, it also supports all of your traditional database SQL syntax. So it has support for full merge syntax, inserts, updates, overwrites, but in particular, full merge syntax. So when matched, when not matched, do arbitrary commands. And then it executes these merges into Parquet and has a bunch of S3 or blob storage optimizations built in as well. 
So this makes it really simple to implement something like a GDPR pipeline where you have to delete people's data. I've personally been thinking about sending a bunch of CCPA requests to whatever companies own my data at the moment. So expect some from me. And then when you do have a problem, it's very easy to restart, uh, especially with streaming. With streaming, you can just clear out the checkpoint and the downstream table and then restart your upstream stream job. And it'll just start from the beginning and go until everything is complete. And so, I don't know, all of us who manage pipelines have this happen from time to time. Uh, you mess up business logic and suddenly, you know, a swath of data is now incorrect in some way. Uh, this makes it super easy to go back and reprocess those things. So this is just sort of like a mention of the, the thing is we open source Delta in last Spark Summit, so last April, but Delta has been an internal Databricks project for the last almost three years. Um, and so all of our largest customers are using it. In particular, I'm gonna walk through the Comcast use case a little bit because they have um, a particularly large amount of data and discovered some interesting things. But this is just sort of to make it clear, like this is not you know, an unknown technology or an unproven technology. This is really in production, receiving exabytes of data per month, and it scales very, very well. So Comcast in particular, um, Comcast is using Spark to process all of the data they get from their cable set-top boxes. So all of that data flows to Kafka servers and then is eventually dropped into a data lake. Um, what Comcast, the problem they were having is when there's like a big uh, fighting event or the Super Bowl this weekend, the amount of data coming from that set-top box collection is literally going to go to 1,000x the daily average. And so when it does do that, they actually started DDoSing S3 and they were getting throttled by S3. And S3 was, um, S3 will send you like back off warnings and be like, you're not, we're not letting you write any data, you need to back off. Um, and they were getting this because they were having to use such large Spark clusters to process all the data and write all of it. It really actually wasn't the literal size of the data that was the problem, it was the number of files they were trying to write that was the problem that was causing S3 to throttle them. And they were trying to write something like, I don't know, 10 billion files per batch, and S3 was not having that. So with Delta, we're able to implement two things. So Delta has scalable metadata so it doesn't have to load all of the data the same way that a traditional parquet uh, table will. Instead, Delta um, it explicitly lists out the list of files to be loaded. And so when you're reading from or writing to a Delta table, it's able to minimize the amount of metadata you need to process at any given time. This can also help on the compute side because you can use smaller driver nodes for your Spark jobs because Delta's metadata is smaller than a traditional parquet table. And then <clears throat> additionally, we sort of built in a couple other features for them to do to, in the first step, write uh, smaller files to S3, uh, larger files to S3, so they're writing less files. So we sort of like increase the file size by 100x, so they're writing 100 le times less files. And then, um, and then on the second side of that, when you do write data to Delta, because it has ACID transaction functionality, you can easily go in and compact the data that's already in the table. So you can load that data back in and recompact it into larger files so that your downstream readers don't have to make as many GET requests from S3. And because of the ACID transactions, you, do, you can have your downstream readers running the whole time while you're making this compaction happen. So most people who are managing Spark pipelines have built some kind of compaction job in the past, right? But actually timing it so that it's compacting your table during a moment when it's okay to rewrite data is really hard to schedule when you have a lot of pipelines coming off of it. So this makes it a lot simpler because you can dump all of your raw data directly into a delta table, and then you have basically infinite reader scalability on the read side. So you can have several hundred stream jobs coming off of a single delta table, and the metadata just scales up, and then because it's all reading from S3, there's no bottleneck, and it just scales infinitely. And we do have several customers with um, over 500 single streams pointed at one delta table, 
And so it really is just depends, it leverages S3's basically infinite scalability there. And then what Comcast was able to do is they were able to reduce their overall job. What they had done is they were splitting up the job, um, actually like sharding it. So they had 10 shards of 64 instances processing one tenth of the data each. And instead they were able to reduce that to just a single job of 64 instances. So Delta Lake itself is just a library. Um, it's a, a specification for how to interact with the data. And I'll show you in a second what the actual log looks like, why the spec is needed. But in order to actually get started using it, um, you only need to be using Spark 2.4.2 or newer. And then you just include the package. And there's a PySpark and a, a Java pack, a Scala package. And it's designed as a first party data source. So you think of it really as a data source designed for Spark and specifically targeting all the problems that Spark creates. And all you do is you swap over from format Parquet to format Delta. And then this is some uh, roadmap stuff that is coming that we're working on, which is basically including even more database style features. The idea that I want to be able to implement expectations on my data. I want to say this column, I believe, is a timestamp and it should only be greater you know, than yesterday. Or, uh, and then different levels of what to do with the data. So whether to fail the job if it violates it, <laughs> alert someone, or to uh, lambda the data and quarantine it for you. This stuff is in the works and will probably be ready around the time of Spark Summit in June. So what actually does Delta look like? So you see here the, the date part, right? This looks like a normal partition in a normal parquet or ORC table. What's not normally there is this other folder, delta log. And so this delta log is a seried, series of ordered commits. And each commit represents a new snapshot of the table. And then inside the actual data, the data itself is stored as a normal parquet table. So the other thing is it's also very easy if you decide you don't like delta and it's a terrible idea, you can very easily switch back to just being a normal parquet table. All you have to do is delete the delta log folder and it's a parquet table again. So there's really very little overhead and no risk to trying out delta. Inside of those JSON files, there are three operations that can happen. You can change the metadata about a file. You can add a file, or you can remove a file. And that's it. So these invariants give it the ability to increment snapshots and alter the table's state over time. But it doesn't violate any of the object storage principles. So we're never actually overwriting any files. We're only appending. And then we're tracking them all the time. And so this lets us circumvent a lot of the problems that object storage has. We don't ever have to list directories, so we're never sitting around waiting for S3 to tell us what's inside a folder, because we've already tracked every single file that's in the table, and we're adding and removing things at the file level. So each commit that happens, every time I write something to the table, a new JSON file will appear. And that JSON file will contain something like this, add 1.parquet and add 2.parquet. Or if I deleted some data, it'll say remove. And so each writer that writes to the table um, puts one of these new JSON files. And then what do we do when two writers are writing at the same time? Delta uses what's called optimistic concurrency. Um, Optimistic concurrency assumes most transactions should be okay to happen at the same time, right? If you just have two separate append jobs, those are always okay to allow to happen at the same time. What this means is that we check whether or not there are conflicts after the write occurs. So a pessimistic concurrency in a database write means that we never allow two transactions to happen at the same time. Optimistic means we always try to let them happen at the same time. And so what they will do is, um, uh, so like in this instance, user one started at version zero, and it saw that the table state was version zero. User two started at version one, 
and wrote version two. But by the time user one's job finishes, it's now the table's version has now incremented to two. And so the writer says, okay, we're at a new state from when I actually started my write. And then it will check, is it okay for me to still commit the write I was writing? And if it, uh, if it does determine that these don't conflict, that's what it does. It allows it to commit the data. So it basically says, has any of the files that I read originally, have they been modified? If not, I'm okay to still write my data. And most of the time, if a job does fail, it's simply safe to retry it. So then how do we actually scale the metadata, right? I'm sure many of you are looking at this saying there are gonna be 50 million JSON files in here that's not gonna scale at all. Okay, every 10 JSON files, we checkpoint the state to a parquet file or multiple parquet files if you have a big table. What this means is that we're able to scale the metadata's, uh, the metadata's information using Spark itself. So instead of storing this metadata in a database that has a limit on the number of threads it can use or somewhere else, we're storing it in a format that Spark can read natively and operate on with all of its natural parallelism. And so now Spark itself is managing the metadata of the table as a Spark job. And so this allows us, this is what allows Delta to scale to hundreds of millions or billions of files under the table. And so if you actually have that much data, these parquet checkpoints will end up being you know, 10 gigabytes or 50 gigabytes worth of data. But you're trading that off for not having to scan an entire S3 bucket looking for your data, right? So you can kind of already imagine Delta adds a little bit of overhead to a normal parquet table, but trades off massive scalability in exchange for that overhead. So if you only have one gigabyte of data, you can just still use a regular parquet, parquet table. But if you have a thousand, if you have you know, 100 terabytes of data, you're gonna wanna store it in something like Delta that's doing these things so that you can scale the metadata properly. And then, <clears throat> this actually just did just come out. So version 0 0.5 just came out. Um, it improved a few things like concurrency support, um, over time, uh, you need this function called vacuum um, in order to delete old files. So right, we're not going, Delta is never overwriting any files. So over time, there are these tombstone files that need to get cleaned up. That's what vacuum does. Um, update syntax, and then one nice thing is you can convert a Delta table, a parquet table in place to a Delta table. So you can simply run the convert to Delta command and it traverses your parquet table and builds Delta's metadata and then it's a Delta table. And we also have describe history. This lets you show um, every commit that was ever made to the table and it can also record other information such as like who that user was, um, you know, whether what type of commit it was, was it an append, was it an update, um, and both Scala and PySpark APIs. This project works out of the box on um, Azure Data Lake and S3. Um, it requires like certain expectations out of the storage system. We'd love for like anybody interested to be testing Google Cloud Storage, um, or it also works on HDFS, I should mention that. But that's sort of like, it works on HDFS accidentally. That was a lot easier than S3. And this is the website as well. So uh, if you guys want, real quick, I can do a little demo of how the actual code works and what it looks like. There are a lot of concepts here, but I think Delta makes a lot more sense when you concretely see what's actually happening under the hood. And um, real quick, the, the website's Delta.io. Um, that was available for some reason. And it has this nice website, and then really all the activity in the project is happening on the GitHub, where the developers are very active. They've been laying out milestones for each version, um, and there's a bunch of like open issues for things people want. So we really would love to get more people contributing to this project. We're hoping moving it to the Linux Foundation will unblock a lot of people 
um, contributing to it, but there's a ton of work to be done, right? There's 40 years of database research waiting to be implemented for big data systems, and there's so many features that anybody could be doing. So in order to like demonstrate um, the way Delta actually works, what I want to do is try to show how it's both a, a streaming data source and a batch data source, and what that actually means for how you can alter your workflow a little bit. So what I'm going to do is create some fake data um, in a stream. Spark has this nice fake data source called rate, and this will just produce data um, at the rows per second you give it. So it's going to produce 10,000 rows per second um, and use 10 cores. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this fake data into sales data. Um, so I'm going to basically take some random numbers. I'm going to create a product SKU, a quantity value, and a price. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Is that big enough? OK, cool. So create some fake sales data. And then real quick, just to look at it and see what it actually looks like, we'll start, the, um, start up the stream. And so Delta itself, right, it's just a table, um, same as any other like Spark table, really. So you can run all of your normal um, catalog operations on it. You have describe extended, um, other whatever are the five different variations of describe bar in Spark. Um, and under the hood, it's just stored on an S3 bucket. So this is just a, this is a S3 bucket right here. And then inside that S3 bucket, this is where I'm storing it. Really, the only change you'll see is this provider switches from Parquet to Delta. And if I look at what the actual data looks like, it looks um, like some really simple sales data. It has a product SKU, uh, quantity, and a price. And so I'm going to start writing this data uh, to Delta, my initial Delta table. So if you're not familiar with um, structured streaming, like the API for between regular Spark and structured streaming, right, is just you switch write to write stream, and now you're writing the stream of data instead. Here I'm going to uh, partition the output data by date. I'm going to append it to the Delta table. Um, in production, you're always going to set a checkpoint location for your stream, um, and then give it the destination path. And now it's going to start it. I'm going to go cancel, cancel this other one. And so now I'm syncing data um, into this delta table. What I can do is I can go in um, and I can do something like a show partitions on it, right? And I've run this before, so it's going to have an old partition in there. Um, I ran this nine months ago, apparently. And what I can also do, though, is I can query it as I'm writing data to it. So I'm, I'm streaming data into the delta table right now. And I can also just load it and run select star or do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. Because when I run this command, it doesn't care that there's data being written to it at this moment. It's loading a particular version of the delta table, and it's querying those files that correspond to that version. So it doesn't care. It doesn't see the new data coming in, because when I started this query, it locked itself into a particular version of the table. And if I want, I can actually look at those versions and potentially um, pick one out that's of interest to me. And this is something that data scientists like to do a lot, right? If you're building a model, you don't want to build, be training that model on different data every time. In fact, you want to go back and retrain on the exact same data. You want to retest on the exact same data. Or some places, there's legal requirements for model reproducibility. So you have to retain that data that you trained the model on. Delta lets you do that sort of out of the box with time travel and version tracking. So what I have is. Um, Every single write increments this version by one. And so I've written 910 batches to this table so far. And we'll say, sort of, uh, give you some additional metadata about what's happening in it. Um, Delta has these ideas of isolation levels. This is sort of, you know, will be familiar to anyone who's worked with databases for a lot. 
Isolation levels is a concept of like what can I allow to happen at the same time. Uh, right now, Delta has two levels of isolation. There's right, there's serializable, and then right serializable. So if you have, if you're mixing the pens that are okay to mix and match, you do a right serializable. And so if I want to, I can um, take this version and I can select from a particular version. I think that's the syntax. That's not it. All right, this is embarrassing. I actually think it's not. That's timestamp as of. And then Perhaps the more interesting thing to do is move on to the downstream jobs from this, right? The raw data, as we said, is not actually valuable in a real meaningful way yet. So I don't know, this is something that actually happened to me in my last company. Um, at some point we realized that we were recording the price of each object, not the total price paid because we weren't multiplying by the quantity. Um, so at some point, all of our revenue numbers jumped up a lot in a big way, which was awesome. But actually executing that was really difficult. I had to go in and overwrite like two years worth of data. Whereas with Delta, what I can do is I can actually read the upstream Delta table as a stream. So now as I'm appending this data into the raw table, I'm actually gonna be able to update my silver table in real time as well. So as soon as that data comes into the upstream table, the downstream stream is going to pick it up and immediately start writing it over here. And now this data, you know, in, in real life, the other thing I would probably be doing is I would be looking up some kind of business information about the SKU itself, right? And so I might be pulling in from a database or like a Cassandra or some kind of key value lookup store. I'd be pulling in more information about the product. Oh, okay. And then most likely what I would do next is I would take this data that is actually good for doing like product analysis, product sales analysis, and I'd probably start writing this data out to some kind of reporting location, either exposing it to a Presto or an Athena um, or a, a Cosmo DB and pointing something like Tableau at it. And so now I might wanna you know, do like a revenue by day report and I can very easily do this either as a stream as well and use something like watermarking, or I can do it as a batch job. And then the nice thing about uh, batch jobs or stream jobs is because they're always picking up the latest version of the Delta table, you can actually build these pipelines that join together Delta tables and they'll automatically update themselves over time. So you can have like a lookup table that's a Delta table and broadcast it but if you ever update that lookup table, Delta automatically picks up that update through its metadata, and in the very next batch, will load the updated version of that Delta table. And so that sort of finishes it up. Um, do you guys have any questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, 
No, 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 um, absolutely, absolutely, right? Like, I think a lot of people leave intraday data as, you know, like, inaccurate and, and would prefer to get, you know, accuracy. I always say, like, uh, real-time data, you're trading off accuracy for real-time, right? And you're going to do your most or 100% accurate metrics are going to be built by offline batch workloads, typically. Right. 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 So where streaming can still help you though is on cost savings. So because streaming does incremental processing, right? With a batch workload, if I rerun the report for you know yesterday's data uh, or last week's data, like a seven-day window, right? I only actually need to rerun it for whatever days got updated, but I'm gonna rerun it and load all seven days of data and then calculate the same things, even if some of those days haven't been changed, right? With streaming, it's going to only check the new files. And so then you can build these pipelines that are loading, you know, like half as much data or a third as much data. And so where this can really help you is actually on the storage access costs. You're, right, you're, getting, you're getting charged for every get request that your pipelines are executing. And so if you can reduce those by 10x, right, your, some of your storage bill goes down quite a bit as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, if I'm only having, if I only added one new file, I only need to process one new file, then I can just keep all the data I already had and just update with that one file. Yeah, so I think, um, especially with Spark, Spark has um, this trigger once mode in streaming, and what that does is it makes the stream run as a batch workload, where it just picks up all the new files and processes them in one go and then shuts down. So that can be really useful where you have um, batch pipelines that might benefit from this. But definitely, like, there are still plenty of use cases where it's like, okay, like, if I want to report for the last hour of data, I should just run a batch workload for the last hour of data. Other um, questions? Uh, I'm going to bring them up to you so all of us can hear because I hope this works. Yeah. So I can move it a little. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the question is about uh, HDFS versus object storage. Um, like HDFS just behaves like a real file system, so it doesn't have eventual consistency problems. So it. Um, like some of the metadata stuff scales a lot better. Like uh, you don't have folder listing problems or like that kind of stuff. Whereas like on S3, like if you have more than 10,000 objects in a folder, the listing actually becomes a huge bottleneck. Um, so there's like Delta has a ton of optimizations that are actually built in specifically for object storage. And like one of them is actually this like zero padding in the commits. This forces them to get ordered in a certain way, and then we can use um, this more efficient API list from instead of having to list. So there's just like all these tiny little things like from reverse engineering object storage. Uh, HDFS doesn't have these problems, so it just works. It's very fast on HDFS. Other questions? I'm curious about what the uh, performance implications were of adding asset properties to something like this. Right. <clears throat> yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, if you like, um, if you compare, you know, a 100 gigabyte delta table with a 100 gigabyte parquet table, and you partition them the exact same way, um, you probably will see slightly slower query times with delta. In the order of like a couple seconds to a couple milliseconds. So what we do is um, when you're querying the table the first time, um, we actually have to load the table metadata. I'm trying to look for this. Yeah, so here, like this Spark job is actually loading the table metadata. Um, and then, but once it's loaded it the first time, it caches it in memory. So then subsequent queries against that table are gonna be very comparable to Parquet. And then, we're working on a feature called uh, data skipping. And the idea is um, Parquet already has the min-max values of every column in the Parquet footer. 
But if you take that, the problem with that though is that in order to do push down there, you have to go to the footer of every Parquet file still. So a lot of times it's actually faster to just load the data and filter it in Spark than it is to do predicate push down in Parquet. And so instead, if we collect those data skipping values into the metadata about the files, then we can do better query planning. When you query the table, we can skip a bunch of files. And then by doing that, then you, know, like you might be loading 10x less data than you would with a parquet table, where it's not able to do that data skipping. Oh, I think there's a question over here. OK, I'll get to him next. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, what were the reasons uh, for giving it to the Linux Foundation, if not to Spark? And, um, so what is the license? Yeah, yeah, great question, great question. So the, the license is still Apache. Um, the reasons for not giving it to Apache just have a lot to do with how the foundation governs projects. Um, I don't know if you've been following with Spark, but um, Spark 3, has been trying to come out for the last seven months now. And like a lot of the problems is that the way Apache projects are governed is that a uh, major version is the only time to get a feature in. And if it's not in by 3.0, it can't be introduced at all in 3. And so there's all these like weird problems where like everybody, all the committers are trying to get a ton of code into Spark 3 because otherwise they'll have to wait till Spark 4. So at this point, it's been uh, over a year since Spark 2.4 came out, whereas before, Spark would do two to three or four releases per year. So like, I mean, some of it too is just project maturity, and as it gets bigger and bigger, releases slow down. But at the same time, a lot of it has to do with the actual project governance rules. And so that's what we really were looking at, um, especially, you know, Linux Foundation also owns Cloud Native Compute Foundation. And so that's where Kubernetes is. Um, that's where a bunch of other projects are. So we just kind of saw it as like a different foundation with slightly different governance rules where we could iterate a lot faster on this project. But it's still sort of become a foundation that people are putting these cloud projects in. And then the, the other thing is um, it is a data source, right? So just the same as like Parquet is not a part of Spark. Parquet is its own project. So that's why it's a separate project as well. This guy. So you're doing optimistic concurrency. You guarantee that I will never get complete if I can reset. But I have a slow transaction competing with a, a lot of short transactions. I'm never going to get done unless you guarantee it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that can definitely become a problem, you know, like when you're trying to do updates against the table, you know, like two sets of updates will conflict a lot of times. So one thing we do have is we have partition level isolation. Um, so if you're able to isolate the updates at a partition boundary, then you can avoid that. Um, but like you absolutely could end up in a cycle of, uh, the only thing is that we don't retry that job right away. So instead, we just fail it. Um, and we try to detect as early as possible. But you definitely could. What? GDPR, delete 100 people. Right, delete 100 people. And at the same time, I'm updating you know, 10,000 people. Well, you're constantly adding stuff. Oh, so I mean, appends never conflict. Yeah, but they'll, they'll, you have to check those 100 people could be in those ads. You never know. Right, right, right. So I mean, it does depend on like the semantics of correctness here, right? Like uh, if I submit a deletion request for a person, and then while that deletion request is happening, you add a new row for that person, right? Uh, it's, I don't remember which side we err on. Um, I do think we err on the optimistic side, so we'll allow both transactions to go through. But it definitely does sort of um, like create a little bit of a... a By law, you can't actually partially somebody in the So uh, just to be clear, I'm not a lawyer. Are you a lawyer? I've read a lot about GBR. Yeah, I've read a lot about GBR too, but just to be clear, neither of us is lawyers, right? Like, so like I did read, like, so what you have to do with GDPR, at least from what I've read, like you have to actively delete from current systems, and then you also have to promise to delete from backups as they become available for deletion. 
So this is where like things start to get a little bit weird, right? Like your S3 bucket could have retention policies. So it doesn't even matter if you delete it from Delta because maybe your S3 bucket is backing it up as well. Like, we're definitely not claiming Delta to be a, what? No, so, right. So you cannot undo a delete, right, exactly. So uh, the way Delta works is, um, so I, I say I want to delete one row. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll try to identify the single parquet file containing that row. And then we actually write out a new parquet file without that row. Then separately, you run the vacuum command. The vacuum command deletes all tombstone files and you can't time travel past the vacuum. So then that way you ensure that it actually is fundamentally deleted. But this is where like, I actually want to clarify with, my, with our lawyer about whether or not this is true. Like the way the backups part is phrased in GDPR law, um, it would appear that we're deleting it from the current snapshot of the delta table and it will be cleaned up by the vacuum once the delta table's retention period is hit. So I'm pretty sure in some way you can definitely work out a compliant uh, pipeline using that. So. I was just using that as an example of a transaction that will be very slow and right. race with a, almost every other transaction. Right, right. And so that's like another API that's in the works is also the idea of locking, right? Which is most databases is, will also provide you a way to lock a table so that a particular transaction has to go through. I think like this is where, you know, like compared to a database system, it is missing the vast majority of things Postgres provides, right? But all of these things are, don't exist over object storage natively. So that's where Delta is starting to try to build these things up. Other questions? You had a section about uh, dealing with you know, uh, consistency with two writers. Um, has there been any uh, look into using uh, non-volatile memory on a uh, system in the cloud to, uh, I know there's a lot of academic research uh, indicating that that's a great way to address some of these problems? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so especially like, more and more as the clouds have NVM hardware available, um, that like becomes, you know, more and more of a, a solution. Like in, in particular, like we've seen huge benefit just from using MVME instances for shuffle files because of the speed you get back from it. And it's a good staging location for putting data to object storage as well. I think like that's one of the biggest challenges of these distributed systems, right, is you don't have shared memory that a database normally has and can, can use to do these things. Um, I, we are like working on features related to that, but that's not something that you know we've sort of like addressed immediately. No, it, it, that also becomes sort of more of like systems architecture. Some of this too is just sort of like, given that we are writing from Spark, what can we do? You know, and how can we build a, a storage specification that Spark would op be optimized for? It's sort of like I try to phrase it as like um, you got all these benefits of separating storage and compute over a traditional database, but you're, it's actually still good for your compute to be able to expect certain things out of the storage. So maybe a very basic question. I um, mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, basically it's a library. You can also specify a certain way of directly layout uh, spark uh, from metadata. I'm still thinking is there something don't need to have processes running somewhere don't need to execute or make use of so you can't be just a library, right? So you're running distributedly and what do you use for that? Right, right, yeah. So, so it relies on Spark for the execution engine. And then the, the reason why I call it, like really what they, I would say it is is, is, is this. Delta is a transaction log protocol. It's a protocol for interacting with the data and reading the Delta log to then read the Parquet data. 
Um, so it, it really is just telling Spark how to interact with this data source, kind of similarly to how existing data sources already work, right? Like partitioning in a parquet table or RC table is a storage spec, and Spark knows how to read that storage spec. Can I understand that this means that you're more tightly integrated with Spark actually? So um, I, I thought I, uh, I picked up uh, that you mentioned that um, managing your metadata is part of the um, option. But, but you basically you always go together with, with Spark because you can be very basically. Yeah, right now, um, the only way to write to Delta is from Spark. Um, we are trying to engage with the Flink community to yeah. build out a Flink writer. Oh. Yeah, and, but for the most part, like a lot of this stuff is driven by like customer requests. We don't actually have any customers asking for other systems to write to this level of storage. Most people just want to be able to expose it to Presto and Hive for the most part. And so the, the Hive community worked with us to build the Hive connector. So now if you can create a Hive table that natively updates with each snapshot of the Delta table, and then um, soon should be the Presto reader as well. And then we have ways to read already in Presto, but you get like a static view of the table. Other questions? Thank you all.